Hey there. Welcome to History Chats. Uh, we're doing some reruns um, for the next couple weeks. Um, I'm recording this at the beginning of, of uh, uh, well, at the end of May, I guess. Uh, but for June, you know, we're going we're gonna to so show some old programs that, um, you know, while we are taking some time off from doing live ones, uh, catching a breath and, you know, might even take a Thursday uh, off from work for the first time in a long time, um, you know, uh, we thought we'd put up some interesting programs that maybe you didn't get a chance to see uh, the first time around. Um, this is definitely one of those. Um, you know, and also to give a little bit of background of, you know, how we, how, yeah, how does this work? You know, what, what maybe some insights and behind the scenes about the process of doing history chats. I don't know if that's interesting to people, but, you know, hey, it couldn't hurt. Um, I don't want to necessarily get too deep into the process of how we choose a topic or not choose a topic, because it's, it's not actually that, that complicated. Uh, Gary and I will sit down and we will figure out, like, what is the theme and sometimes there's a specific theme, you know, we're going to be talking about this, you know, dairy, June is dairy history month. So one, one year we did, you know, dairy history. Um, uh, often what we will do is we'll pick a more flexible kind of concept, like people you should know, which allows for us to tell a story of somebody that you've heard of before, or maybe you haven't heard of something that people are going to want to, oh, uh, you know, we want to know about that person. And then sometimes, and I don't want to say it's, it's necessarily for us and not for you, but sometimes it kind of feels that way. Like, this is a good example of this. And, and honestly, I thought this was going to be a, a really popular one because um, it's Ted Mayer, uh, Mayer's Shoes. Mayer's Shoes is something that people remember getting their shoes, uh, you know, in, in Wassa. Uh, it's a beloved, long-standing retail store here. Um, but maybe it's because of the title and thumbnail that I created. Maybe it was just the time of the year. It just didn't end up taking off. Uh, you know, as of as of recording here, we've got 30 views on it. Um, and this is from uh, almost a year ago, which is which is all right. Um, I, I again, um, when we when we choose topics, we don't necessarily try to make them, you know, clickbaitable and the most popular thing. Sometimes you have uh, but, but one of the reasons that I think Ted Mayer uh, makes for a great program and something that I, I wish that people got a chance to, to see more is because it is a compelling story. I think he has a really interesting story that we can flush out. And, um, you know, sometimes people suggest, hey, you should do a story on this or you should do one on these. And they're often great so suggestions. They I love it when people suggest things because, you know, it gets, gets good ideas. Uh, but often it's, it, you know, you run into the problem of like, yeah, that would be a good one. I don't have a picture of that guy. Uh, or, you know, we don't really have much visual material to go along with this. Um, and so then it takes a little bit more time to, to dig up the story and to try to find creative ways to tell it. And uh, sometimes, you know, we just have a great collection like the art of Ted Mayer, and it just kind of falls into place as being a great visual as well as a good story to go along with it. Um, and I think that this is a, a good example of, again, this is one of my favorite. I think this one came out uh, really well, um, but it's one that people didn't necessarily tune in for. And, you know, that's all right. Um, here's a second shot at it. Uh, you know, despite the, the, the weird thumbnail that I decided to create and, and calling it the art of shoe advertising, uh, I think, I think there's a really cool story and, and hopefully stick around and enjoy it. Um, yeah, Gary and I will be back, uh, with more history chats, some live stuff, some new stuff in the near future. Um, in the meantime, I hope you are enjoying your your summer or whatever it is when you're watching this. And um, you hope you don't mind that we're taking some time to do some reruns and, you know, hopefully enjoy seeing some of this. Um, and if you have any suggestions for, you know, great programs that or programs that you remember that you, you think that people should go back and watch, I'd be very curious to see that too. So if you want to share that, go ahead and do that. Anyway, I'm going to kick it over here to past... Uh, broadcaster uh, Ben Clark, and he's going to take it away and tell you all about the lovely story of Ted Mayer and his uh, advertising. Hi there. Okay. So um, today we're talking about uh, Ted Mayer. Um, so for these these programs that we do, uh, you know, people you should know we kind of try to find one of a, a person that's going to be a nice mix of someone who is going to have an interesting story that we can talk about and something we have some visual stuff to go with it. You know, it's not just, um, Hey, this guy's important, but we don't really know much about them. Um, that sort of thing. This is definitely falls into the category though. Of, I kind of just want to talk about Ted Mayer. 
Um, so in our collection, we have um, a bunch of other stuff, but this is a, a scrapbook that was, was donated from his family. Um, this is the, the main uh, starting page here. Um, and it's it's really interesting because it collects his his stuff. Um, in, you know, it's a scrapbook, right? Of of his art that he did. Um, you know, ideas, sketches. Some of them became advertisements. Um, I think some of them did not. I kind of just wanted to share them, um, and then that from there we got to let's talk about Ted. Uh, before we get to Ted and his art, though, we should talk about the context of how does. How does he come into being? You know, where what is his, his background? Um, so this goes back to Charles Mayer. Charles B. Mayer was his father. Um, this is him a little bit later uh, in 1900. But uh, he was born in Pittsburgh in 1863. And then he ends up moving to Wassa with his family by 1878. Uh, apparently by this point, he's already working um, for a local company. Um, and he ends up, you know, finding a job here. Uh, pretty quickly as a teenager, working for Mueller and Quant, who I believe are are sort of, I don't think they're just shoe dealers, but they are one of the first uh, companies that are, are kind of focusing on selling shoes. It, it's kind of an interesting period because in the 18, you know, 60s and 70s, um, you know, certainly people here needed shoes, they needed boots, they needed stuff to put on their feet, um, but there really wasn't that you know, a retail shop specializing in shoes specifically is something that's going to be kind of hard to do. Uh, but in the 1880s, you have the railroads connected, so you can get, you know, a, a connection um, to the wider world, and you can bring in that sort of thing. And also, there's a population. The population of the city is growing, and so there is the the demand for potentially a specialized shoe shop. So um, he works for them for a while, and then in 1890, he goes into business with his, his uh, brother-in-law, Alfred Richard, um, to create the Mayor Richard Shoe Company. So he has his own shoe shop now. Um, now, he, I believe his, his brother-in-law, Alfred, is, is more for financing uh, as opposed to actively running the company. Um, I can't really see him uh, in the records living in Wausau. Um, and in, by 1895, uh, the company's doing well enough that um, Mayer buys out Alfred and um, becomes the Mayer Shoe Company. Now, this is going to uh, grow here. Again, from 1900, this is the interior of the... Um, the shop. Um, kind of interesting to see shoes stacked like that today. Uh, you know, it's a little different out, um, layout than shops that you might be used to seeing. Kind of cool to see. Um, so he, he gets his sons involved by 1913, um, Ted, Theodore, um, and Charles uh, Jr. And they join the company. Um, and actually, uh, after a, a brief time for World War I, um, Ted goes off and serves in the Army Signal Corps. Um, I, I, think, I think Charles does as well, but I, I could be wrong about that. Um, I'm not sure exactly. Uh, Ted was a little older, so maybe that worked out differently. But anyway, um, after that's over, in 1919, they reincorporate and actually incorporate for the first time as the C.B. Mayer Shoe Company. Um, and they include um, the sons in, in, in the running of the company as officers. Um, and they're going to do pretty good business throughout the 20s. Um, by the end of the 20s, they are going to kind of invest in renovating the old national, uh, First National Bank building, um, which is on uh, 3rd Street here. Let me bring up a, here's a Google Maps here. So here's the 400 block, right? So Grand Theater, all that. Um, Back in the distance, here, here's the, the, where the mall was. Um, so Landmark or Hotel Wassa. Um, interestingly, this is uh, the uh, Lots Mayor building. Um, that was actually, uh, there was a big fire here, and the building that was there was, was gutted, and um, the, the mayors uh, invested in a new building as a business venture. Um, and so, uh, but their shoe store wasn't there. It was actually on the 300 block. Uh, but they moved then into this building on the corner, which is now the NWA building here. Um, originally, the national, uh, First National Bank, and, and now it becomes Mayor Shoes. Um, so that's kind of an important thing. So here you can see, uh, again, that building. 
Um, this is a little bit later. Um, it's not a great picture. Apologize for that, but you can get the idea. Um, later sign here uh, with that are flat, flat. That's flat against the the building. Um, here's an example. It's on the left here of that that iconic uh, era in which the signs went off into the um, sidewalk. Uh, but again, there. I think in the '70s they they passed a city ordinance that said that maybe we shouldn't have stuff that's hanging over pedestrians and into the city. Um, and so they had to they had to change that, but yeah, that's the building. It's a, it's a great you know it's a three story building, basement. They have a an elevator service, which is kind of novel. Seven different departments when they open in 1930. Um, yeah, lots of stuff. The other thing that happens here though is earlier before that even happens in earlier in 1913, um, Charles uh, Mayer Senior, um, the the founder of the company, passes away. And so the company then is left in the hands of his sons, um, Charles Jr. and Ted, uh, or Theodore George Mayer. Uh, uh, Ted becomes the president. Charles handles the, the books. He's the secretary treasurer or the bookkeeper. Um, their mother uh, stays on as vice president for a number of years to kind of give some help with that. And uh, yeah, so that's the, the, the company that they're working for, the, the, the family business. Let's talk about Ted for a specific, uh, specifically, where did he come from? So, Ted was born in Wausau in 1890, the same year as the, uh, the start of the shoe company here, his father starts. Um, he is going to graduate from Wausau High School in 1908, and then he's going to go on to, uh, to school for about two years in the University of Notre Dame, and then he will go to the Chicago uh, Academy or School of Fine Arts, they use a bunch of different words there, but by 1913, he's got a degree. Uh, he's, he's an experienced graphic designer and fine artist, and he is going to come work for his father um, and eventually, as you've seen, uh, be brought into the company as, as one of the, the people running it. But um, he brings his artistic sensibilities with him, and he really innovates a lot of things. I, this is the first time, and I, I could be wrong about this, but I think this is the first time that I've seen a proper advertisement uh, for Mayor's Shoes um, in the Daily Herald or local paper, right? Um, this is 1917, so it's kind of late. And I think this is absolutely the influence of Ted um, and taking over some of the ownership of the company. Like, they appear in the paper earlier than this, but this is a, a proper ad, right? And, and you know, there's a shoe drawn, so you know what we're doing. And um, he's going to continue to to provide a lot of the advertisements, from what I can tell, um, you know, personally hand-drawing, and I think laying out a lot of the stuff. There's some really artistic ads. Uh, this is this is one of the, the more ones that struck my attention because of just the amount of space it takes up. You know, ads, newspapers at this period in the 1910s into the 20, early 20s, like the way that you sold your your business is you you told people about it. Like the way that you do this is a, you know maybe you have a nice graphic to catch someone's attention, but then you have a you know, lots of text. You explain you know what you do and how you're going to save money and how you good quality, and you try to lay out a, per, a you know persuasive argument. And this kind of goes in contrary to that. You know this is a very there's a lot of white space, um, and I think that that is something that you know most folks shoe owner, uh, owners of shoe companies probably wouldn't, you know, go in for, and yet, um, here, here they are. So that's kind of cool. So they also, in addition to the advertising, and we'll talk more about the advertising in a second, uh, but some of you may remember the days when you had a x-ray machine at the foot, uh, at the shoe, shoe shop. Um, so you can see this is an advertisement. They, they get one in 1921. Um, I'm not sure what kind of model they have, but, um, you can see in the top left here, um, you, it has, uh, so, so the woman here is standing in, they, they mainly use this for kids. Um, it seems to be the, the helpful thing because, you know, if you're, if you're a, uh, a parent trying to buy shoes for your child, the, the child may not really be able to articulate what it feels like and whether the, the you know, the, the, the shoes are going to be too small or too large. And so the idea is, well, you have them sit there and, um, the way it worked is it, 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 you, you turn, turn it on and the, um, the process would go and you could see in real time the foot wiggling. So you could see your bones move. And so the, the, the child could sit there. You can see that the, the, the viewer that she's holding on to is, is quite a bit 
It's not really up at eye level, and that's so that kids could see themselves. And then there were two other spots for the, the mother. Uh, in this case, uh, the assumption mother would buy the shoes. Which, yeah, that's kind of how that worked. And then the salesman could also look, and then they could, he actually had like a pointer. You can, um, you know, he could kind of navigate that and show like, okay, see, the, the feet are too, too crunched up here. It's a definitely a, mo a novelty, right? This is not something that, it, as it turns out, there's a couple problems with this, uh, partially because, you know, you can kind of see, like, to the point where your, your, your actual bones are being scrunched up is probably way further than you're, you know, logistically going to need to know. Um, because a lot of what, what a foot has is the soft tissue that doesn't appear on an x-ray. So if your toes are, you know, uncomfortable, um, this is not going to give you a more exact fit than just normal methods. Uh, it's also obviously problematic because there's radiation involved. Uh, x-ray machines put off a little bit of x uh, radiation, and that's not great for, you know, customers who are who are doing this. Maybe just once in a while, you know, just getting a little uh, dose of radiation isn't isn't going to kill you. It's not going to cause adverse health effects. But certainly for the salesman, um, it's 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 not great. So. Um, I don't know. Um, so first of all, I should say that I don't know if Mayer is the only one. They are the first in Wassa to get an x-ray machine for shoe fitting purposes. Um, they may not be the only one. I think they probably had it longer than we see advertisements. They stopped like pushing it as a, um, as a convenience and something like a selling point um, by the, like the 40s. Um, and certainly by the 50s, it became clear, like, people recognized, yeah, there's problems with this. But, you know, x-ray machines continue to be used in many places long after that. Um, but, yeah, like I said, it was a novelty. It was kind of an interesting thing. Um, and, and you can kind of see that in some of the advertisements going back uh, to, to what he, he's doing. Um, I should also say he also, like, part of the idea is I think that that Ted... And probably to an extent, um, you know, the new generation, his brother as well, they saw that that part of modern advertising is, you know, having a brand, but also getting people in the door. And so they would have things where they would have acts and have the kids come and, and you know, see the, um, you know, I'm not I'm blanking on what actually they would have. But uh, in 1922, the following year after this, he he installs a radio in the shoe shop so that people could come in and hear concerts from Detroit um, or, you know, stuff that's happening in Chicago. Like you could, at a time before everybody had a radio, you know, come into the shoe shop to, to hear the radio. Um, so there's a lot of that sort of stuff, right? But advertising is interesting too. Um, you know, the, the ads at the time, you know, he, he goes out of his way to sketch out ideas. And, and I think this is, this is where I really wanted to talk about. The reason that I, I, you know, chose Ted to be a great topic for this is that, you know, these, these ads from the, the 20s and this whole book here from um, 1920 to 1930 is mostly what's in here. There's a little bit after that. I think it's, it's really interesting because you can see this is a trained artist, but it's, it's, you can see on the left, right, this this first one, that's a very artistic sort of, ab not really quite abstract, but the techniques you're using is probably not, you know, everyday sort of usage. Um, it's very much of the 20s and early 30s, a lot of this work. But at the same time, um, it is also kind of an everyman kind of idea. Like, these are newspaper cartoon style. Um, you know, if you, if you go on the internet and you search for, you know, graphic art or or art in the 1920s, the Art Deco style, like they're going to give you really extravagant stuff. And this is kind of down to earth a little bit um, in an interesting way, uh, but also very much of its time as well. And, and I think between these, I think you get an interesting idea. So in, in this scrapbook, there's a lot of sketches. Um, he, he did a bunch of like, um, almost like things that you'd have at the top of a stationary, like a header for, for stationary uh, or something like that. Uh, but also for advertisements. So this is this is a kind of in-depth one that he created. And this is a large scale. It would be shrunk down. Um, and here he is kind of laying out a potential ad. I don't know if this ad ever got used in a newspaper or if they had flyers or, you know, whatever. Uh, again, some of the stuff is, is him kind of putting ideas out there and kind of collecting them. Um, but some of the stuff did get published. And, and you, you can see that kind of being worked out here. Like he had clearly... Um, you know, drawn something that he wasn't happy with. So he, he cut out, um, and he did these on like 
like boards um, kind of speak. Uh, hold on. Yeah. Should, should have got this ready earlier, um, but you can see that it's just like a bit of cardboard um, and it's, you know, it's thick. And he would, he would use the ink drawing on that. And then as you can see here, he just kind of overlaid it. So kind of cool there. But again, you know, to the style, there's this uh, sort of very 1920s kind of, you know, Art Deco stuff. He, he definitely drew a lot of shoes. I didn't scan too many of those. Um, I made like 46 scans of that book. Um, a lot of them are shoes, which makes sense, right? Um, and so these are, these are pretty uh, artistically done. Um, a lot of his stuff is kind of simplified down so that you know you're looking at a shoe. But, but at the same time, a lot of his stuff has this sort of intricate nature, that, that very 1920s um, into the 30s sort of way of, of graphic design. Um, not something that you'd see on a regular basis necessarily if you're just reading the paper, but um, he tries to bring that to it too. Also kind of interesting, so this is a, uh, from 1920, they did a mail uh, catalog, right? So you can fill out the order form, send in some money, and they would send you some shoes. Um, I, th I think it's really interesting how he lays this out. Uh, he has a foreword um, with this text. Like, it doesn't need to be this fancy text. It doesn't need to have this, you know, header up here of a, of a winter scene. Um, I mean, how many Sears and Roebuck calendars have you seen or, you know, the catalogs from JCPenney's or, you know, whatever catalog you get um, that have a foreword? Uh, this, this feels more like it's a, a program or, or some sort of... You, Part of this is they're still kind of figuring out the format and how a local company would do this, but you know, and then you and then you do flip it through, and he's got the you know his his style of drawing some shoes, um, but also just laying this out. You know, here's the prices. It's 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 nice and simple, and it gets the job done in an interesting way. And and probably this all has the effect of you know giving um, the, the shoe company a bit of a, a boost. Um, people enjoy this. He also did some stuff in these years, uh, again, from the, the, the book um, and other things that he's done um, for other companies and other groups in the area, um, again, in the 1920s. So this is uh, Ritter and Deutsch. Um, they have a new carpet and drapery shop, and so he, he you know, does a whole pamphlet for them. Um, but again, it's not like it's a... I mean, this is, is very much of the late 20s, that sort of style. He's got the, the purple and green. Um, yeah, just really interesting to see this. Uh, again, this could have been a, a nice sort of just catalog. It could have been a, you know, a bifold or something very simple, but um, he put a lot of effort and, and time into making this look cool. Uh, similarly, um, he did a bunch of stuff for the arts uh, community around here. Uh, John Winnegar had a, a touring company, so he did this uh, booklet. Um, he also did a lot of programs for the, the Grand Theater. Uh, well, the, the Grand Opera House, which then became the Grand Theater, in 1926-27. Um, but again, like, this doesn't need to be this extravagant. Uh, he, this is not something you throw together in an hour or two. This is this takes a lot of time and effort and, and artistry. Um, and so it's really cool, kind of cool to see somebody do that. Um, and it very, again, very much of the style of the times. Um, so he's also getting involved in other things. Um, so this is jumping ahead a little bit to 1934. Um, this is Ted on the far left in the back there. Um, he is involved uh, not just in running his own company, not just in providing, you know, uh, programs for the, the Opera House, um, but he is, you know, a member of the, the Wisconsin um, Shoe Retailers Association. He's a president from uh, a couple years and is very involved in sort of statewide organizations, national organizations, um, and also local. Um, so this is, you know, the committees of the Chamber of Commerce, uh, they decide, this is, this is in the 30s, they start doing this thing where they have Wassa days as a kind of way to get people into Wassa, um, and he designs a bunch of art. Again, I don't know what this was all used for, and you can kind of see the du duality here of something very fancy and also something kind of very down-to-earth, you know, a newspaper cartoon type thing. Um, the idea being that, you know, hey, we want to get people to come to Wassa and, and, and buy stuff from us. So we're just going to have a coordinated sale citywide. And so all the companies would get in on this and that would, you know, get all the people that are maybe on the fence about traveling to town to do shopping. Well, this is a time to do it so that, you know, you can get the good deals. So I think that 1934, it was a three-day event um, and they revive it later in the 30s as well. But again, you know, <laughs> just kind of cool to see the art 
um, that he produced for it. Um, it doesn't need to be this extravagant, but he, he put the effort in, which is cool. Uh, Winter Frolics is another thing. I did a whole program on this, was it last year? It feels like it was a little bit longer ago. Uh, but this is a winter uh, sports festival that was held here. Again, a kind of way to get in tourism and promoting local sport, uh, winter sports. Um, but Ed, uh, or Ted uh, provided a lot of the art for this. Um, this is a, this was this um, thing that I was showing before. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, just kind of providing a little bit of art to kind of, I, I don't know if this was used uh, to what extent it was, but he put, this definitely was. Um, this is the second year, and you can see this as a poster for the event. Um, and so you now we see him in color, um, you know, showing off what we're going to see. You know, ice skating, figure skating, speed skating. You've got hockey, curling, and, and ski jumping. Um, and uh, yeah, so down in the bottom right, you can see his signature. He provided a lot of the art. And this art becomes, you know, even after he steps away from making new stuff, um, it continues to be an important part of this. I, particularly the ski jump and clown is kind of the, um, you know, the representation for this this whole event. Um, and it, it is, gets used year after year. I, they drop it by the mid-30s um, in, in favor of something more simple, as the Great Depression causes a little bit of austerity, I guess. Um, but yeah. And and it's worth noting, this this goes beyond. I don't know if Ted, uh, he ever got credit for it. Um, he was he was uh, had passed by this point, but when they revived uh, the Winter Frolics in the late '70s, um, here's here's the clown. So um, it, it, iconic in a way that that speaks to that era again, like we see with a lot of his stuff. Now beyond the 1930s, I don't have as much of a collection of his stuff, but there's some interesting things that he was involved in. He was a avid photography uh, sort of inter in, novice phot photographer, um, amateur is what I meant to say, amateur photographer. Um, it, was a, it was a hobby of his. Uh, apparently, he was experimenting with some techniques called uh, light painting, where you can kind of see on this picture here, um, there's like a, a pen flashlight that he would, you know, add to, but the exposure to, I, I don't really understand what it was, but apparently it could have, um, you know, kind of a surreal effect. Uh, it's, it's complicated, but basically he's experimenting with it and he's recognized, you know, uh, this article talks about uh, a little feature that was published in Popular Photographer, a national leading magazine for photography about his techniques. Um, and he can use to paint as well and do other things too. Um, this is 1959. Um, the Historical Society actually, in those days, we did art exhibits, uh, partially because we didn't really have a lot of actual exhibits. Collections were a little... Uh, scarce, and so sometimes we just needed to fill the space, but also we got to be relevant and have new stuff coming in, and, you know, this is before the, the art museum uh, gets created, and so, yeah, I had Schoenberger comes to town and says, hey, let's have some art, and and so here we go. Um, I wish I had better pictures of this. I thought I might, we might still someplace. I couldn't find it in time. Um, we have slides and stuff going back to these years, uh, but this is, you know, at least gives sort of an idea of what he was up to, uh, again, I'm sure that he continued to grow as an artist and, and to try new things. I think this is kind of, at least from my uh, non-trained art eye, I guess, I, I don't have, you know, studied it or anything, but it, this feels very much of like the an artist from the teens and 20s um, and, and 30s kind of growing for the next 20 years. There, there's elements that kind of make it kind of of that era. I probably am not uh, qualified to speak on that, so I'll move on. But anyway, recognition here from a local level too. Now, as I said, uh, Charles uh, and, 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 and Ted take over the company. Um, I, I believe Ted, it, until the end of his life, I, he dies in 1972, and I'm not sure exactly when he steps down or if he, he doesn't, and he just does it until his, his death. I kind of focused on the early years, uh, but after his, his passing, um, his son takes over, uh, Richard uh, Mayer. Um, this is, by this point, he has been, in 1982, um, the chairman of the Board of Supervisors for Marathon County, um, and a, an alderman here representing the 5th District, um, so local politics as well, as well as uh, running the day-to-day -day of the shoe shop as president. Um, Charles continues to be, um, you know, doing the books until um, 1982, they decide uh, it's time to close the downtown location, and so Mayer's uh, closes its doors 
Um, Charles actually uh, passes away in 1984, um, around the time that they're looking at, uh, Richard apparently was, was contacted by some friends and said, hey, we should, you know, this new mall thing that we have here in Wausau, we should get in on that. Uh, they were looking for stores to go in there, and they said, okay, well, let's start up a Mayor's Shoes again. Um, again, I think I probably, we probably have better pictures of the building itself. This is during a, uh, some event or something, but you can see the, the, the shoe shop back there. Um, and they were in the mall from 1984 until 1989. Uh, just shy of a century, uh, the, the 100-year anniversary of the founding of uh, the shoe shop by, his, uh, by Richard's grandfather. Um, but unfortunately, by this point, um, apparently the, uh, the funding, the, the, the people that actually controlled the finances kind of decided to, to pull out, um, and so the, the company closed. So, yeah, there you go. There's, there's a little bit about uh, Ted Mayer's art. Um, and his, his career, the mayor's shoe shop. Um, I know I covered a lot and also felt like I left a lot out there, um, but hopefully you learned some stuff, and, and now you know a little bit more about um, Ted Mayer, Theodore George Mayer and his art um, and shoe stuff. Whew, stick the landing on that one, didn't I? Um, yeah, I'm going to check to see if there's any questions or anything. Uh, nope, doesn't look like it. That's all right. Um, we're going to continue this theme of, uh, you know, we have one more week here in the month. So next week, we're going to go back to until this. Now, okay, so we were going to have a special guest. Um, unfortunately, we were unable to make that happen. The, the, the idea was we wanted to get somebody involved in the um, what, the DC Everest Oral History Project, um, which has been going on, had, went on for many, many years. Um, and it's a great program. And unfortunately, uh, you know, the people that were involved that, you know, they were interested, but they just, for scheduling reasons and, and health concerns and things like that, they decided um, to decline. So um, in lieu of that, um, Gary and I will be coming back next week, and we will be talking a little bit about that program. Um, and instead uh, of, of a guest, we're just going to, you know, talk about oral history and, and the, the many generation, well, the many classes of, of students that went through the D.C. Everest School District that got a chance to do so. So that would be a great, uh, I, I, it should be a good, good program as well. So, yeah. I think we'll probably call it there. Um, hopefully you enjoyed a little bit of, the, you know, the art here. Um, and, and forgive my... Uh, amateurish art critic. I, I, I don't know. This is just me kind of wanting to share some stuff, some, some observations that I've seen, um, having looked at the sources and everything. I think uh, pretty cool. So now you know Ted Mayer, and um, I think I'll probably call it, call it here. So have, have a wonderful afternoon. Um, we'll see you next week uh, for more, another person, or in this case, a program you should know. Um, and uh, yeah. Till then, see you later.